Hey everybody and welcome back to Biology 206. My name is Dr. Jennifer Baltzer and today we're going to be continuing our discussion of uh, biotic interactions in ecology. Uh, our last lecture was on predation, uh, which includes, of course, as you recall, predators, herbivores, or carnivores, herbivores, and parasites. Um, we're skipping over chapter uh, 13 on parasitism. We touched very briefly on parasitism in our predation chapter, um, and we're skipping to chapter 14, the topic of which is competition. Okay, so one of the very earliest studies of competition was carried out by Sir Arthur Tainsley, a British botanist, and he conducted this study in, in 1917. Um, he was interested in studying these two species of, species of gallium, which occur in nature on different substrates. One occurs, one tends to occur more in acidic peaty soils, here characterized by this, this purple, and the other in calcareous soils. Uh, so more alkaline soils um, at ca characterized here in orange. And what he did, we already learned about these, the idea of a common garden experiment, but he conducted a common garden experiment with these two species of gallium using these two different soil types that they occur on in, in nature. And so he grew each of the species, so gallium saxatile and gallium sylvestra. He grew them alone on each of those substrates and then he grew them together on each of those substrates to look at how well each performed. And what we can see from this figure is that um, gallium saxatile did very, very well on acidic peaty soils. This is where it's found. And, you know, it was able to survive on these calcareous soils. It didn't do as well, but it was, it did okay. And the reverse was true when gallium sylvestre was grown alone. So it did, it performed best on the calcareous soils. Um, and somewhat, somewhat worse on the acidic soils. But when we planted the two species together, so having both gallium species growing together in both of these soil types, we see that Sylvestra did much, much better and um, did much, much better than Saxatile in the calcareous soils. And in fact, Saxatile did worse when grown in competition, when grown together with Sylvestra, than it did on its own. And the same can be said for, for, for Sylvestra, when grown on the acidic soils. Um, it was badly, it, it, it underperformed compared to Saxatile, and it did worse when grown together with Saxatile in this peaty soil than growing alone. Mm. So what this shows us is the impact of these interactions between the two species when growing on these different substrates together and um, that also it demonstrates the impact of environmental conditions on the outcomes of competition. Okay, so a great early example of competitive interactions and how those are modified by the environment. Okay, so and a definition for competition. This is taken from your text a non-trophic interaction between individuals of two or more species. And I put a little asterisk here because we're going to get into the fact that you can have intraspecific competition as well. So a non-trophic interaction between individuals of two or more species in which all species are negatively affected by their shared use of a resource that's li that limits their ability to grow, reproduce, or survive. Okay, so I just wanted to show this little diagram here because I think this does a really nice job putting all of these different biotic interactions into context. And so in this diagram, we have species two on the y-axis, species one on the x-axis, and then each of these bars cor boxes corresponds to either a positive, neutral, or negative interaction, okay? So where species one is positively impacted, we see that uh, in the presence of species two, we see this can be mutualism. This is where both species benefit, and we're gonna be learning about mutualism in our next, um, our next section. Uh, it can be commensalism, where species one benefits, but species two doesn't feel any effect. And this, this is a situation, for example, you know, an animal taking shelter in a plant. There's no benefit to the plant, but the, but the animal gains benefits. So this is an example of a positive neutral interaction, okay? And then there's the situation where a species one benefits, 
but species two does not. And this is what we learned about last week. So predation, herbivory, parasitism, you know, carnivory, uh, all of these situations where one, one species is consuming the other species. And so one species benefits and the other species does not. Um, we also have this situation where um, species one or species two has, shows no response to an interaction, but the other species experiences a negative effect. And we're gonna be looking at this toward the end of this lecture. This is a situation where um, there's really asymmetric competition where one species is a much, much superior competitor compared to the other. And so the presence of the inferior competitor doesn't even impact the, the superior competitor, but that this strongly asymmetric competition will lead to basically the loss of the second species from the system, okay? Um, and then this, of course, is our focus of today, where we have both species one and species two both experiencing a negative effect of the interaction between the two species. And this is competition. So using shared resources and because of the limitations of these shared resources, both species experience a negative impact of that of that of that interaction. Okay. So, this is the focus of today, but this puts this puts competition into the context of all of these other biotic interactions, some of which we've learned about, some of which we have yet to learn about. Okay, and so this is where my asterisk comes comes in. Can individuals within a species compete? And of course, the answer to that is yes. Um, so I just wanted to highlight these two different types of competition, one of which is interspecific competition. So what we saw in that last slide where there's one, there's two species or sometimes more species competing for shared resources. And so we have competition between individuals of different species. So interspecific, when you hear interspecific, that's always between two different species. Intraspecific is always between two individuals of the same species, okay? And so uh, uh, we absolutely can have competition between individuals of the same species. And we have a couple of examples here of, of inter-specific competition where we have two, um, you know, large predators, a hyena and a lion. They share kind of a similar position in um, the trophic a similar trophic position in uh, savanna ecosystems in Africa, where both are predators um, and both consume similar prey resources. And so in this case, we would have interspecific competition between hyenas and lions. In this lower picture here, we've got two flamingos battling it out. And so in a lot of cases, when we have intraspecific competition, so two individuals of the same species competing for resources, um, we'll see this, you know, in, in this case, this is probably some kind of interference competition, you know, likely for something like mates or territory um, or some share or food, because of course, the close, the more, you know, when we have intraspecific competition, the resource requirements are all identical. And so individuals are, are actually competing much more intensely between one another um, in, in some cases. And so so we have lots of these examples of intraspecific competition um, that, that occurs. Okay, and I did want to just show this little video, um, hopefully this will work, uh, demonstrating those two different ideas. You know, actually, I will let you watch that on your own um, since you are going to be, um, since you'll have these PowerPoint slides You'll be able to see it and hear it better if you play that video. So there's a little YouTube link. Um, it just demonstrates for the same species examples of interspecific competition that it's experience, experiencing as well as intraspecific competition. So please, as you're going through these slides, as you're going through this lecture material, click on this link and take a look at it. It's some beautiful underwater footage um, and a really kind of neat video uh, narrated by uh, the, the wonderful Sir David Attenborough. Okay, so the key issue when we're thinking about competition is resources, and this can be any number of things. 
But basically, the definition for this is the components of the environment that are required by species. This includes food, this includes um, shelter, this in, or nesting, nesting areas, or you know, territories. Um, this includes this includes mates. Um, so there's there's any number of resources that are shared by um, or that are required by species or individuals within a species. Um, that that are that lead to these competitive dynamics, and so in most environments, these resources are not in unlimited supply. And so, if one individual consumes or uses resources, that leaves less for other individuals. And so, there's this competition that happens for these resources in different ways. Okay. But when we think about the resource environment, I'm just going to do a little a little reminder of one of the important topics we talked about earlier um, in our organisms in their environment lecture, but this idea of the fundamental versus the realized niche. Um, and so here we have one species, and we have these resource gradients. Here we have a two two resource um, two different resources, and their gradients from low to high. And our species one occupies this central part of these these resource gradients. And in fact, we know this is many many different resources. Um, but when we're thinking about the fundamental niche again, this is the full set of resources along with other biotic and abiotic requirements. So when we think about biotic requirements, for example, we're, we're going to be getting into mutualisms, um, the mutualists that that species one requires to access resources one and or two, for example. Okay, so this is our fundamental niche. It's the entire resource space that species one is able to occupy. Okay, and if you recall, the realized niche is the part of the fundamental niche that a species occupies as a, as a result of negative species interactions. Okay, and so this, if you, if you recall, this includes predation, um, this includes com competition. This includes amensalism. If you are the, on the, the negative receiving end of that of that um, interaction, and so we see what this does. If species two through six are all using different parts of the resource space for species one, where species one ends up is dictated by how strong these interactions, how st how negatively those interactions are impacting species one. If species two through six are all superior competitors for these resources compared to species one, then you can see how much, how greatly reduced species one niche space is compared to its full, its fundamental niche. So its realized niche becomes very shrunken down if all of these species are able to um, outcompete species one for these resources. So just a little reminder, we've already talked about this, but it's a really important ecological concept and it really comes into play very strongly in, these, in the context of these biotic interactions that result in negative impacts on one species or the other. Okay, and so then when we think about competition, there are different ways that competition can happen as well. Um, and there's three different main ways. Um, I think maybe only two of these are highlighted in your text, maybe the third is as well. Um, two of them are, are real competition, and so we see that here, this interference competition and exploitative or scramble competition. They're real competition. This is you know, where individuals are competing for shared resources, and I'll talk about each of those. And then we have a parent competition um, that I'll, I'll get into in a moment. So interference competition is when an individual directly alters the resource attaining behavior of other individuals. And so we saw that example of um, the flamingos with their necks all tangled up with one another. But you can imagine all kinds of different situations where, and so, so this, this shows that competitor one directly interacting with competitor two. Okay, so this is where they actually have some kind of conflict, whether it's, you know, male, you know, male gorillas fighting to determine who's going to have, who's going to be the, the silverback and, and have access to all of the, the mates in the, um, in the group, whether we're thinking about, uh, you know, the, the lions and the hyenas who are both competing for the same prey species and, and maybe one is, is better than the other at, at, at protecting the, the, the prey once it, um, once it has, has secured that. 
you know, there's there's any number of um, examples. Um, structural plant parasites are another great one. There's a, gr a, a really amazing picture of kudzu, um, uh, kudzu vines in your text where you see these, these vines that have grown over top of all of the other plants in the system. And so they've just completely interfered with the ability of those plants to access key resources, okay? So this is interference competition, direct interactions between two, um, two species. There's exploitative or scramble competition as well. So when individuals interact indirectly as they compete for common resources. And see, you know, the, the most obvious example of this is plants growing together where one plant grows a little faster and is able to access more of the light compared to the other plant. They're not necessarily directly interacting with one another. They're not there's no physical contact, there's no, um, uh, you know, there's no direct interactions necessarily, but the fact that once one species, what an individual of one species is able, is able to grow much faster and kind of um, access those resources before the other means that there's that, that limitation. So you can imagine this scramble as a gap opens up in the forest, this scramble to be the, the first to overtop everyone else. You can think of that as you're thinking of the scramble or exploitation competition. Um, okay, and finally, there's a parent competition. So this is not true, it's not real competition, but it's when two individuals that do not directly compete for resources affect each other indirectly by being prey for the same predator. And I know that some of you are using this kind of idea as um, in, your, in your minute ecology talks, but you know, the idea is if you have the presence of the two species, so competitor one and competitor two, they don't directly interact with one another, but because they're both prey for the same predator, being together in the same environment attracts that predator to the region and has negative impacts on both of these species. So a great example of this is, um, we talk a lot about apparent competition when we're thinking about boreal, boreal caribou. Boreal caribou are um, declining across North America for many reasons. Um, one of the reasons is that their habitat, er, their habitat is, is shrinking because of, of disturbance and human, human uses, habitat loss and degradation of, of boreal boreal forest um, when you have too many individuals of the same species with, within a patch or when other ungulates are sharing the space with those carnivore with, with sorry with those caribou so for example moose or deer then all of a sudden your your density of ungulates is much higher in that region and this draws wolves and other predators to that area because it's, it's a bit of a feast for them. It might, makes it much easier for them to capture their prey if there's more prey av available, especially in a system like the boreal forest where prey densities are often very fairly low in lots of, in lots of situations. So apparent competition, not a true competition per se because these two species are not competing for re a shared resource but they're both negatively affected by the presence of another. And so um, I just wanted to talk about that as well. Okay, so there we, there we are. We've talked about intra and interspecific competition. We've talked about interference, scramble, exploitation, and apparent competition. So there's lots of different ways you can think about competition being carried out. Um, this is the mechanism and then the inter and intraspecific competition has to do with the, you know, how the, whether you have one species competing for resources or whether you have multiple species competing for resources. All right, and, and then, you know, the intensity of competition depends on resource scarcity. So when resources are in, in ample supply, um, either because it's a really great year for that particular resource, environmental conditions um, mean, that, mean that that resource is really highly available. We can think about um, masting which we talked about last week when there's a mast year there's much less competition for those um, seed resources because they're plentiful um, or if you have a low density of the of individuals competing for a shared resource then uh, then oftentimes that resource will be an apple supply so in those situations competition will be very will be very weak because there's lots of resources to go around as those resources begin to get scarce, 
um, either because environmental conditions lead to low availability of a particular resource or because the population size of um, the competitors has increased, this is where we start to see the intensity of, of, of competition increasing. Okay, and for plants, um, one of the examples from your text talks about some really classic uh, examples by um, uh, Wilson and Tillman from um, grasslands in Minnesota. And the interesting thing about plants is that, that they experience competition in, in different ways. They experience competition above ground and they experience competition below ground. Of course, plants require water and nutrients from the soil for growth and they require light from above for growth. So a, you know, a part of the challenge with understanding plant dynamics is that we need to understand what's happening below ground and how limiting those resources are, as well as how limiting light resources are. And so typically what happens with plants is that they're, they will allocate more biomass to, toward production of the plant part, which helps them reduce resource limitations. So if nutrients or water are in short supply, they'll, they'll allocate more to below ground uh, biomass. When light is in short supply, when they're shaded, then they will allocate more biomass to above ground um, plant parts in order to try to grow up and gain more access to light. So the experimental design was really interesting here. The scientists set up plots that were high and low nitrogen, and then they used uh, a focal species uh, a perennial grass species native to Minnesota that they were interested in and they planted these these individuals of this species into these high and low nitrogen plots. So they had three treatments. The first treatment was without competitors. Okay, so this grass, this perennial grass species grown on its own. The second treatment was um, grown with competitors where there was competition for both root and shoot resources uh, or competition between roots and shoots of plants so there was the potential for shading and there was the potential for competition for below ground resources and the third treatment was only below ground competition and the shading was reduced so the plants were um, the uh, the above ground parts of the competitor plants were sort of pulled to the side so the the focal species was able to have as much light as it wanted, but was still competing with these individuals below ground. So they were able to um, look at different aspects of competition above and below ground competition using this experiment. experiment. And so what they found was that in, in low nitrogen plots, their competition index, so the, the y-axis is index of competition inten intensity, and the x-axis here is low nitrogen and high nitrogen, two, their two, treatment, two of the treatment categories. When nitrogen was low, competition intensity was below ground, competition intensity was very high, okay? And that's exactly what we would have expected. Um, if you're nitrogen limited, you're gonna allocate more resources below ground and plants are going to interact with one another below ground to try to access those resources. Um, then in the plots where there was shading happening, we have this light availability index from zero being none uh, to 1.5 being a higher level, so less to more light availability. And we can see the same kinds of situation when light availability was low, the above ground competition intensity was high. So plants were allocating more resources to above ground growth when they were shaded compared to when they weren't. Um, allowing them to try to outcompete their neighbors for these limited resources. Okay, so in plants, competition becomes extra challenge, you know, extra challenging to understand because you have to try to capture interactions that are happening both below ground and above ground, and the limiting resources can change through time, um, leading to different, um, different outcomes between individuals. Okay, and when we think about competition, there's a whole, a whole spectrum of outcomes of competition. Very often you can have competitors that occur, um, co-occur together, um, and even though they're negatively impacting one another, they continue to co-occur. But in some situations, we see what is referred to as competitive exclusion. And this is over time, when you have two species that are using resources in similar ways, um, the superior competitor can eliminate an inferior competitor from that area, okay? 
And this is, this is when we think about that asymmetrical competition and that the extreme of that being amensalism, where, where the superior competition isn't even really phased at all by the presence of the inferior competitor and that inferior competitor is driven to extinction. Okay, so here we have an example where we have uh, two different diatom species. And so diatoms are, are unicellular algae, but they're really unique in that they produce uh, a cell wall that's made out of silica. So they're, they sort of live in glass houses almost. So we have uh, Sinedra and we have uh, Asterionella. And so Sinedra grown alone and Asterionella grown alone, and then the two of them grown together, all right? And so what we're seeing here is the diatom density. Uh, and in each case, it starts at around uh, 10 to the third cells per milliliter, and then increases to this um, to some to some level and and maybe maybe tapers off a little but stays pretty stable so we end up with this sort of asymptotic population growth and while that when that happens we see that uh, the silica concentrations drop right down so as diatoms are produced they take up silica from the from the water and use it to build their cell walls, and then that so silica is depleted in, in the water, and this is what limits the growth of the population, okay? And so here we have Sinedra alone, and it um, produces a, you know, it increases its uh, population by an order of magnitude nearly, and the silica concentration in the water is, is drawn down. Same thing here for Astrionella. Uh, it increases its population size to an even an even higher level than Sinedra. Um, and note that the silica concentrations also decline, but not to quite as low low of a level as Sinedra. And so then, so so they both did fine when they were growing alone. When grown together in you know, the same, the same conditions and the same water, what we see is that Sinedra does very well. It increases its population size. Um, and we started a higher, a higher silica concentration here, you'll just note. Um, so Sinedra increases its population size and stabilizes, just like we saw over here in, when it was growing alone. What we see is that Astrianella, the population numbers decline quite rapidly. So they start to increase and then they decline. Um, once silica concentrations drop too low. And, and if you recall, one of, so one of the explanations for why this happens, so, so in the presence of Sanidra, Astrianella basically goes locally extinct in these, um, uh, in these uh, artificial growth conditions. Part of what's happening is that Sinedra is able to draw the silica concentrations down much lower than is Astrianella, and so as a consequence, it changes the environment and is able to out it's, it's a better competitor for silica in the water compared to Astrianella. And so we see these kinds of situations where one species outcompetes the other, and it leads to competitive exclusion. And so as I mentioned, we have a gradient of competitive effects, um, and so we can look at this we have um, effects of species one on species two and effect of species two on species one. So the larger the bar, so in this case, a large bar means that species one has a very large effect on species two and zero means that it has no effect on species two. Same thing for species, the effect of species two on species one. Here we have no effect of species two on species one. Here we have a very large effect of species two on species one. And so this is a gradient where we have these kind of middle areas where we have competition happening and probably competitive coexistence, right? So they're negatively impacting one another, sometimes a little stronger than the other, um, but they're, they're negatively impacting one another, but they're not to such an extent that there's total asymmetry in, in the competition, so asymmetric competition. Whereas, you know, there's, there's some asymmetry in some cases, but not not to the same extent as where we get to these sort of outside edges of these um, gradients and you have a very, very large effect of one species on the other and no or little effect of the other species on the first. Um, and this is what we refer to as amensalism. And just to remind you when we moved into this little um, box, competition is where both species has a, have a negative impact on the other. Um, amensal, amensalism is where one species has a large negative impact on the other, 
and and doesn't doesn't experience any negative effect of the other species okay so this just shows that and so within this orange zone we may have this competitive coexistence where competition occurs both species are able to maintain population densities to some extent so then th then this leads us to the competitive exclusion principle that two species that use a limiting resource in the same way cannot coexist indefinitely okay and these these curves look very similar uh, as is the the previous ones. Um, here we have paramecium, another, uh, another type of um, uh, unicellular organism. And um, we have population density here on the y-axis for each of these graphs and the number of days on the x-axis. And what we see is different combinations of species. So um, uh, paramecium caudatum alone this is the blue line, so it reaches some high total cell volume per milliliter. And paramecium caudatum grown with paramecium bursaria. Okay, and so we have a, a lower population density. So when grown in competition, the population density of, of paramecium caudatum is decreased in the presence of uh, bursaria. And the same thing happens for bursaria. So here's the population density of bursaria when it's grown on its own. When it's grown in combination with caudatum, it's lower, but it's there. So these two species can coexist even, even though they're obviously competing with one another for resources. In contrast, we can take a look at Paramecium aurelia grown with Paramecium caudatum and Paramecium caudatum grown with Paramecium aurelia. And we see that Paramecium aurelia shows a curve that's very similar to the alone curves for each of the other species. Paramecium caudatum, in, in contrast, starts to increase, and then as resources become, as population sizes of both become too high, the population crashes and it, and it is lost from that system. And so we have competitive exclusion here. And so the difference between these two examples is that both of these species of paramecium, Aurelia and caudatum, use the same resources and use them in the same way. And so their main food source is, both for both of these species, their main food source is bacteria. In contrast, Paramecium bursaria and Paramecium caudatum, they both use bacteria, but when they grow together, Paramecium bursaria will switch to using um, yeast cells in, in the water as well. So Paramecium caudatum will use uh, the bacteria, Paramecium ber uh, bursaria will use the yeast preferentially when grown in competition. And so as a consequence, they're able to partition the resources and grow together. Not as well, but they're able to do it. Okay, so if back to this principle, these two species cannot coexist because they use the same resources in the same way. Whereas these two species can coexist because even though they can use the same resources, they can also change the way they're using resources that allows that coexistence to occur. Okay, so this is just to highlight that idea um, that one way to avoid competitive exclusion is by having species that use resources in different ways. So resource or niche partitioning. If competitors are not using resources in the same way, they can coexist. So we have this really simple example of these yellow birds that are everywhere from the ground all through the tree stem and up into the canopy, eating these little black beetles that are, that are living all over the place, okay? So this is when the yellow species is occurring on its own. Now this red species moves in and the red species starts to eat the food resources, these little insects that the yellow species um, consumes. Now in this context, if both species are using the resources in the same way, whoever is better at getting those insects is going to become the dominant species in that system and drive the other one to um, exclude the other one from the system. In contrast, if the red species that moves in prefers to eat insects on the tree stem only, then this still leaves the ground and the canopy for the yellow species to consume these insects. And so this, these two bird species are then able to partition resources and use different parts of the tree 
even though they're using similar resources, they're using them in different ways. Okay, and so this allows, so this is resource or niche partitioning that allows competitors to coexist um, and avoid competitive exclusion. Okay, and another way that we see um, competitive exclusion being avoided is, is through evolutionary processes. Um, so competition can drive evolutionary divergence between species that would have previously shared resources and, and driven and, and resulting in competitive exclusion occurring. So what we can see happening is character displacement when you have really, you know, competitors that use really similar resources and um, are directly competing with one another, this can lead to uh, directional selection. So we heard about this where, you know, here we have species one and species two, very similar, let's say in this case, prey size. And so they have, they really share a very similar prey size, but they both have, you know, tails, of course. So we see this typical uh, normal distribution that we, that we see when we're looking at frequency of traits. Now through time, because they're competing heavily for one another, individuals of species two that select for a larger prey and individuals of species, species one that select for a smaller prey <coughs> may be favored because they will be experiencing less intense competition. This can lead to directional selection. So directional selection of species one in this direction, directional selection of species two in this direction, um, leading to reduced overlap of their resource requirements and greater potential for for um, competitive coexistence. Okay, and we have this example of uh, finches uh, from the Galapagos Islands where, you know, when they're grown on their own, when they're, when they're occurring on their own, we see, uh, we see very similar beak sizes and they would, that means that they're using very similar food resources. When they're grown co-occurring, so on Pinta and Marchena Islands, we see this directional selection where the, the beak of um, uh, Fortis becomes a little bit larger, where the beak of uh, Fuliginosa becomes a little bit smaller, and as a consequence, they're no longer competing for shared resources. So this is what, this is what character displacement is. Okay, and, and then, you know, another, another thing to think about is the fact that as the, you know, if the biotic or the abiotic environment changes, it can reduce the competitive ability of species. So this idea that no species is going to be the best competitor in every environment. And there are changes in both the biotic and the abiotic environment through time. Okay, so we have changes in biotic and abiotic conditions that can alter competitive outcomes. And here is a great example of this. Um, here we have the biomass of ragwort in blue. So it's an invasive species in these grassland systems and it out competes when, when it's doing well, it out competes the grasses and the forbs that are native to these, um, to these grasslands. And this is from Oregon, I believe. Now, so we had this situation in 1981 where ragwort had really driven these grasses and forbs to very low biomass. So biomass on the y-axis, year on the x-axis. But then we had the introduction of the ragwort flea beetle, beetle which, which um, preys on ragwort. And so it was introduced and led to a really rapid decline in the biomass of ragwort, which allowed these grasses and forbs to recover their biomass uh, quite substantially. And so you can see as, as different players come into the system from a biotic perspective or as the environment changes, this can really modify who is going to um, best succeed in a particular environment. Okay, so just bringing back this idea of competitive exclusion and the realized niche. So here we have our realized niche example again. Um, and then we have this, this nice example of chipmunks in different mountain regions. Uh, so three different mountains, uh, Oregon Mountain, Mount Taylor, and Magdalena Mountains. And there's two different species of chipmunks that occur in these areas. 
two different Tamiya species. Um, and so we have this species reflected by the orange here. Um, so it is the only species that occurs on Oregon mountains, and you can see that its distribution is right from the bottom of the mountain to the top of the mountain. Same for Magdalena Mountains, T. dorsalis is the only species uh, that occurs, the only chipmunk species that occurs on this mountain, and it occurs from very low altitudes to very high altitudes. When they are grown together, so we have Mount Taylor here, when they are grown together, we can see that the, um, the realized niche of, of the, the niche of each of these species is greatly reduced. So even though their fundamental niche is from low to high altitudes, low to high elevations, when grown together, um, Tamius quadrivitatus is restricted to these higher elevation locations whereas Tamius dorsalis is restricted to these lower elevation locations, and then they have some overlap where they would be competing with one another. So clearly, Quadrivitatus is a stronger competitor at high elevations, dorsalis is a stronger competitor at low elevations, and then they're able to sort of coexist at these middle elevations. And so what this does, as you can, as you can imagine again with our realized niche diagram, the true environmental space that each of these species can occupy is greatly reduced in the presence of the other. Okay, and so just a really nice example of how the realized niche can be greatly reduced with these negative impacts of competition. Okay, so we are, we're coming toward the end of the lecture. Uh, one thing I will note is that there's a section in your text on Lock and Volterra competition uh, competition model so it's a modified version of the lot cavalterra predation model we're not I'm, I'm not going to be covering that so you don't need to to cover that when you're when you're doing your readings if you're interested please go ahead but i would leave that to po the population ecology course to cover that okay so another key piece to remember is that uh, another change that can happen we talked about biotic changes to the environment but a really key abiotic change to the environment that can help to promote coexistence is disturbance, so wildfire, um, canopy gap openings. Here we see this, these tip-ups. You see the roots just being torn out of the ground. This is probably due to a large wind event. That will open up the canopy, increase light availability to the ground. Um, these disturbance events lead to the opportunity for um, species that are not able to deal with the current conditions, so in this case, forested conditions, uh, they're not able to deal with that, you know, low light environment. Um, it allows them to return to an area for short periods of time until that forest canopy grows up again, for example. So when we see um, when we see disturbances occurring, it helps to um, maintain maintain the diversity of an area because you have. Uh, different species that have different resource requirements, different competitive abilities that are able to be maintained in those systems through primary or secondary successional processes or by, you know, ephemeral increases in, in resource availability that occur with disturbance. Um, and this is actually linked to an idea referred to a talk that's the intermediate disturbance hypothesis that, that low levels of disturbance and high levels of disturbance both limit diversity um, Low levels of disturbance allows the you know, strongest competitors to really become dominant. High levels of disturbance don't allow the system to recover fully. But at intermediate levels of disturbance, you can have sort of the highest, highest species richness, highest species diversity possible um, because of you know, the creation of these different resource environments through time and space. Okay, so disturbance can modify the competitive environment and um, you know, this links in with this idea of fugitive species, which is highlighted in your text. And, and I would really think about those as the ultimate competition avo avoiders. So these are species that are not able to deal with um, competition and they move, they disperse to places where that have been recently disturbed um, that allow them to do fairly well in those uh, uh, disturbed areas before the area recovers and then they disperse to some other disperse to some other regions. So fugitive fugitive species disperse from one place to another to take advantage of disturbances that open up resources and allow them to avoid 
competitive exclusion. And this is exemplified here in this um, uh, sea palm example. And so here we have sea palms, uh, Postalicia palmiformis, palmiformis. Um, and this is a situation where here we have density in individuals per meter squared in year x plus one and density in individuals per meter squared in year x. Okay, so this is in time one, time two, let's say. And so from one year to the next, if there was self-replacement of this species, we would expect this line, so a one-to-one -one ratio. So 40 individuals in year x would result in 40 individuals in year x plus one. But what we see, in fact, is a great reduction in density. So this blue line, the true data, is well below um, uh, the density in year one is, is much higher than the density in year two, or density in year x is much higher than the density in year x plus one, meaning that over very short time periods, you know, the, it, it demonstrates the intolerance of this species for any level of competition. As other things start to grow around it, it does very poorly, and so it has to disperse and move to some other new disturbance, okay? So this is year X, which is the time of disturbance. Even in just one year following disturbance, we see this great reduction in population size. So this species does not do well in the presence of competition. It's very rapidly excluded competitively, um, but it uses this fugitive species mechanism to ensure that it's able to um, continue to exist. And so by, by the, the presence of these disturbances allows the species to continue to exist in the environment. Okay, so just to, just to wrap it up, bringing you back to this, this big chart of our biotic interactions, we've now talked about predation, herbivory, parasitism. Um, we've talked about competition and we've covered off these ideas of immensalism as well. And our next lecture will be on mutualism and these are really really fun and exciting interactions between organisms where both of the organisms benefit, whereas today it was both having a negative impact on one another. Our next lesson will be on, on these, these more positive interactions and the, and the benefits that these symbioses have for um, the, the mutualist organisms. Okay, and with that, I will say, say farewell. I'll see you Tuesday for student hours, and I hope you all had a great reading week. All right, take care.